So hello again. Today we're going to be talking about the SR flip-flop. We can now get to this point since we already covered the D flip-flop, which kind of introduced us to the concept of working with flip-flops. So now we can start using more commonly used, uh, easier to use flip-flops. So for this flip-flop, it is very commonly used and it's called an SR flip-flop because it stands for set reset flip-flop. So basically I wrote down the excitation table for the flip-flop right here. And as you can see, when S becomes one, Q becomes one. And when R becomes one, Q becomes zero. This basically means that the S will set the Q output to one and the R will set it back to zero. And then I have something else which I did not include in my last video, but it is our basically characteristic equation for this flip-flop. This equation right here will help us determine what inputs should go into either S or R. So I copied and pasted the same exact example that we did with the D flip-flop, and we're going to see how the example changes and what steps, additional steps we have to take. So I also did change that A and B, since now we know that we're going to be connecting the output into back into the input. I named it Q1 and Q2 for the initial inputs and Q1 plus, Q2 plus for the outputs. It's a way to demonstrate how Q1 and Q2 plus are basically the next instant of Q1 and Q2. So now that we have a little bit more of background, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking for the inputs that are necessary. So I added to our table the S and R of the first flip-flop. So let's call, let's call this flip-flop SR1. Later on, I'll have to add another two columns for SR2, but I just want to focus on the first one. And this SR will represent the output, the first output, Q1+. plus. So what we're going to do is basically see how our logic takes us to that answer. And once we have that, we are going to verify it with this characteristic equation right here. So let's start by reviewing kind of what the SR flip-flop does. What it's going to do is whenever S is 1, Q plus will become 1. And when R is 1, Q will become 0. So now let's look at when Q1 changes. Q1 changes right here in this group and right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say Okay, and the first change is going to change from 0 to 1. So that's the equivalent of setting the flip-flop. So S is going to be a 1 for th where the first 1 is present. So we're going to put a 1 right here. So this basically means that when we plug in S and R naught, this will be a 0 because remember that S and R cannot be 1 at the same time because that would cause an error and an undefined value. R is 0. So now we have S which is 1 and that basically makes Q, T plus 1, 1 which is the correct value that we have in this table. So that way we could verify that this is correct. Finally for the second group that we have for this column it's changing from a 1 to a 0. That is equivalent to a reset, so we're going to put a 1 in R, because that is what the flip-flop will be doing, changing from 1 to 0. If we plug this in into the characteristic equation, we get S. I forgot to put the 0. Remember that whenever there's a 1 in one of the inputs, there should be a 0 in the other. So now we have 0 or R0, which is 0, and QT, which actually does not matter since we already have a zero and anything is always going to be zero. So we have zero or zero, which gives us zero, which is the correct value that we have in the table. 
Now for the rest of the values, we see that it never changes again, so that means that we need to keep the value of q. In order to keep the value of q, we just put zeros in both. And that's basically it. That it will give us the truth table for our first flip-flop. Later on, we're going to have to do k-maps for both inputs, so that is something that is tedious for these kind of flip-flops, and that's why d flip-flops are a little bit quicker to use. But, of course, these have their advantages as well. So let's move on to the second flip-flop. So now that I've added columns for the second flip-flop, we can name this, these two columns, as the inputs for SR2. And we're going to repeat the same process. We're going to identify where it changes. So let's just make this clear by drawing another arrow that shows us where what we are looking to. So S2 will be the output of Q2+. plus. So this is what we're looking at right now. You're only paying attention to the output column. Okay, so now that we have this, we will see that the changes here. It changes here. So now is our turn to see when this will change and when we have to put S or R as 1. So again, we repeat the same process. We see that in the first group. It changes from a 0 to 1, and this is equivalent to setting the flip-flop. So S will become 1. And again, we verify, we always make sure that our Q plus is equal to what our characteristic equation will give us. Then we see on the second group that it's going to change to 0. That is the equivalent of resetting the flip-flop. So we're going to put a 1 in R. We check the third group, which changes to 1, so we're going to put it a 1 in S. And then for our last group, it's going to change to 0, and we're going to put an R again. Remember that you are putting the R not before the output, but in the same line, because this column represents Q+. plus. So it already represents what will happen after the inputs are set. Then we fill out the rest of the table with zeros. Again, remember that if there is a 1 and a 1, so S, both S and R are 1s, it'll give you an undefined value, so really be careful for that. That should never happen. So now that we have our table completed for both SR1 and SR2, what we're going to do is create the K-map so we can see what logic should be inputted into each, each flip-flop. So I'm going to erase these annotations, and I'm just going to leave the table values. Do notice that for SR1, right here, both columns only have one one. So we could do the k-map for that, but it's basically just going to be the term right here and right here. Because we can't, we know that we won't be able to group it with anything else since it's the only one that is on our truth table. So we know that S1 is going to be equal to our first one right here where there is the red arrow. It's going to be Q1 naught Q2 X. And this will be connected with an AND gate. And we also know that R1 is going to be equal to this term right here, which is just going to be Q1, Q2, and X. So this shows us what the advantage of using an SR flip-flop is over a D flip-flop. Usually the more complicated the flip-flop is, it's for the reason to minimize the circuit design outside of the flip-flop. So as you can see, we didn't even have to do k-maps for the first flip-flop because we already know that it's just one term. So all we need are some AND gates for the first flip-flop. So it's it's pretty simple in the sense that you don't have to do much even though you're creating expressions for twice as many inputs. So with that said, let's move on to S2 and R2. Here we do have two ones, so I definitely recommend doing a quick k-map to see if the, you can group these two. So I filled out the k-map for S2. I did it following the same exact steps that I've mentioned in previous videos. It is flipped, it's just to show that you can also do it horizontally, it does not change a thing. 
So as you can see by the K-map, we can actually group these two ones together, just like I explained in previous videos. And we see that S2 is going to equal, we see that X does not change, and we see that Q2 does not change. So Q1 is the one that gets discarded, and we are left with Q2 not and X. Now I'm going to do the exact same for R2. So now I've written down the K-map for R2. It's pretty similar, and we can still group these two, so that's going to be good because our circuit will be pretty simple. So from this K-map, we see that R2 is equal to Q2x. Again, we follow the same steps. We're going to see that Q1 is the number that changes. So we are going to discard that, and we are going to see that Q2 has a value of 1, and X has a value of 1, which means both of them are not knots. Now we have the input equations for both flip-flops, and we can actually design the circuit now. So now I've prepared everything to start drawing our circuit. As you can see, I've drawn two SR flip-flops and named them 1 and 2, and I drew the inputs that will be going into these flip-flops. So now all we have to do is think about each input. So let's start with S1. And so we see that there is only one gate that we're going to have to use, and that's the AND gate. And we are going to connect that with Q1 naught. So we're going to do our little dot here and connect it to the AND gate. Q2, so again a little dot, and finally X. I put X on this side because once we connect Q1 and Q2 to their respective outputs, then it will be easier to connect them without having to go over X. It will be clearer to see. So now that we have S1, we're going to go to R1. For R1, we're also going to have a single AND gate that will connect Q1, Q2, and X. Now we go to the other flip-flop, we look at S2, and again, it's only a AND gate, and this time it's even simpler because we only have two inputs into our AND gate. So that will be Q2 naught and X. Finally, we have R2, and again, we only have an AND gate, so it's just the same process that we've been doing. And that's it. That's our circuit. What we're going to do now is connect the flip-flops to their inputs, just like we did last time. Because remember that the inputs will be the outputs of the previous state. So I'm just going to move this here. Okay. And that's pretty much it. That's our circuit. So as you can see, and if you compare it to the D flip-flop, circuit that we had, it's so much simpler, and we only use one kind of gate, which makes the implementation of the circuit so much easier and less complex than the other one. So just for reference, let me show you what it would look like with D flip-flops. So here I put them side by side, and as you can see, even though for the first, second D flip-flop we only have one gate, it's still an XOR gate, which is different from the AND and the ORs, which means you would have three types, different types of gates. If you were to implement this with ICs, you're going to end up having to use at least three ICs for the D flip-flops, as opposed to just one type of IC, most probably just one IC for the SR flip-flops. So that is a really big advantage that all of these other flip-flops have, and that is why we use them and why they exist and are so popular. So this SR flip-flop is the easiest to understand and it'll usually be the simplest. It's why it is the, probably the most used flip-flop or most common flip-flop. So yeah, that's basically it on it and I hope you understood and that's all.